And as we return to those words in Jude, I want to put your hands up if you've ever run a marathon or a half marathon. Just Nathaniel. Well, I, I once took part in a half marathon uh, as a spectator. Um, but I, I have this, this kind of fear because where I am in Bridge End, uh, there are a few pastors that I meet with regularly and quite a few of them are very serious marathon runners that they run like to run half marathons and when I met with them recently they were talking about these half marathons that they were planning to run and I have this fear that one day I'm going to end up giving in to the peer pressure and I'll find myself on the starting line at the Cardiff half marathon with the 13.1 miles stretching out in front of me and having this sudden panic and realization and thinking well how am I going to get, get to the end of this <laughs> how am I going to get to the end of this marathon and I wonder if you sometimes feel like that about the Christian life, about running the race of the Christian life, about keeping going, about persevering and following Jesus. If you ever wonder, how am I going to keep going and how am I going to get to the end? Those of you who are children, you've potentially got 80 or more years of following Jesus ahead of you. That's a long time. How are you going to keep going? How are you going to keep going to the end? Those of you who are older, some of you here may have been running the race of the Christian life for longer than I've been alive. You've been running for a long time. And maybe sometimes you just feel really worn out and really weary and a bit discouraged. And for all of us, we're aware of the pressures that there are around us the changes that we see in our society. And we're very aware, all of us, of the sin in our hearts and the weaknesses we all have. How are we going to keep going? And how are we going to get to the end? And the short answer that Jude gives us is God. <laughs> That's how we're going to keep going. That's how we'll get to the end, God. The slightly longer answer that he gives us is that it's the God who's able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's what I want us to see this evening, how this God is able to keep us going and how we're able to keep going as we look to him. And our focus will be on those last two verses of Jude where we get told about two things that God is able to do. You may have noticed that as I was reading and as Nathaniel read it earlier, that God is able to keep us from stumbling and then he's able to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And we're going to look at those two things and think about how they encourage us to keep going, to keep running, to keep persevering, even when we may feel weary and worn out and even discouraged even when we're aware of the pressures around us. And we'll think about it in terms of two questions that we can ask as we think about this image of the Christian life as like a long race that we're running. Two questions. What is God doing during the race? While we're running the race, what is God doing? And then a second question, what has he prepared for us at the finishing line? When we get to the finishing line, what has he prepared for us? That's where we're going this evening. We'll start with that first question. What is God doing during the race? As we run this race of the Christian life, what is God doing? And we can start by zooming out from those final two verses and think about the letter as a whole. Because I imagine as I read it earlier on, you probably thought, well, Adam, you've chosen a really cheerful passage for this evening. Uh, you probably didn't think that. You probably think this feels like quite a heavy passage to hear. And it's quite a, a heavy passage to read as well. And there's lots in it which um, is, is quite difficult and challenging and feels very heavy. A lot of the letter is a bit like a giant sign at the end, at the side of the, the racetrack saying, warning, danger, or like those huge signs you get at the sign, side of the motorway. Danger ahead, warning. In verse 3, Jude says that this wasn't the letter he wanted to write and this wasn't the letter he was originally planning to write but something has happened that's meant that he needed to write this particular letter to appeal to them to contend for the faith 
that was once for all delivered to the saints. And what's happened to make him write this particular letter that we may have found difficult to listen to is what's mentioned in verse 4. That there are people who have crept in unnoticed, who've crept in unnoticed to the church. And they're people who are perverting the grace of God and who are denying our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And as they've crept in, they're causing trouble and danger. And then Jude points out some key moments in Bible history. And the Bible is quite a long book, and there are lots of key moments in Bible history he could have chosen, but all of the moments he chose are moments of judgment. Look down from verse 5. We begin with the Lord saving his people out of Egypt, but the focus is on the fact that afterwards he destroyed those who did not believe. Then in verse 6, we get the angels who have been kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And then we get Sodom and Gomorrah who were destroyed and serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. And then we get Jude going on to say about how this isn't just a problem in the past, but there's this problem for them and for us today. A problem in verse 12, these people who've crept in who are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. These people who are waterless clouds swept along by winds. These people who are fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It all seems a bit bleak, doesn't it? Not a cheerful passage to read. It all seems a bit bleak. And into that bleakness and that gloom, we get some instructions in verse 20. You, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life into the gloom Jude gives those instructions to build yourselves up in your most holy faith pray in the Holy Spirit to keep yourselves in the love of God and keep waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and you look around at all of the bleakness and the gloom that Jude has described and you look at the course that lies ahead of us you can think really how am I going to do that how am I going to keep building myself up in my most holy faith? How are we going to keep ourselves in the love of God when the course that lies ahead is so long and so dangerous, when all of this darkness is all around us, when there's all of this bleakness and all of this gloom? How are we going to keep going? And how are we going to get to the end? And I think that's why Jude, carried along by the Holy Spirit, ends this letter in the way he does, after all of that bleakness and gloom, he lifts our eyes from the dangers we may face. He lifts our eyes from the dangers that lie ahead. He lifts our eyes up to see God, to remember what God is doing as we run this race, to remember the God who is able to keep us. Having heard about all of those dangers, and those people creeping un unnoticed, and those judgments from the past, we remember the God who is able to keep us. That's the first encouragement for this, this evening, as we remember what, what God is doing during the race, this God who's able to keep us. And the reason it's an encouragement, it's not just that God is able to keep his people, but this is something that he actually does. He's not just able to do it, he does keep his people. You know, imagine in the notices one week, Nathaniel mentions that you're going to have some kind of a special event. I'll leave you to imagine what the special event is. And during this special event, to get ready for it, you need to decorate the building. And so Nathaniel asks, uh, if there's anyone who's able to help with decorating the building, let me know. And you go up to Nathaniel after the service and you say, Yes, Nathaniel, I'm able to help. 
but I'm not going to. That wouldn't be much good, would it? I see some of you are tempted to do that, uh, but it's not helpful. But, but it's, it's like that here, that we're not just being told that God is able to do something that he's not going to do. That's no good to us, is it? We're told about something that God actually does. That Jude is reminding us that as we keep ourselves in the love of God, that we are being kept. That Jude is reminding us that as we build ourselves up in our most holy faith, that there's another power that is at work. The power of God's spirit who dwells inside his people. The power of God's son interceding for us at the right hand of God. The power of the father, his protective hand surrounding us. At the end of the letter, Jude takes us back to where the letter begins. If you flip back to the start of the letter, verse 1, and you get this wonderful description of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be someone who belongs to Jesus. Jude says he's writing, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful three-part description of what it means to be a Christian who you are if you are a Christian this evening. You've been called, you are beloved in God the Father, and you are kept for Jesus Christ. So as we run, we're not running alone. We're not even running on our own initiative. We're running as people who've been called by God, people who are loved in him, and people who are kept for Jesus Christ. That as we run, we can trust in the one who's able to keep us. We can trust that God is able to bring us across the finishing line, this race of the Christian life. Now on our way to the finishing line, there there is a way that we will stumble. I think of the words of James, who says, we all stumble in many ways. (laughs) And that's true. Uh, All of us who follow Jesus, we all stumble in many ways in the sense that we don't always run in obedience as we should. We often stumble in sin. We stumble in disobedience. And we stumble away from God. But in those moments when we stumble in sin, what's God doing? Well, in his mercy, he lifts us up and keeps us going. He prevents that stumble being a a fatal and final stumble. I think that's what Jude is talking about when he says that God is able to keep us from stumbling. Ultimately, he will keep us to the end, to that finishing line. And getting to that finishing line, even with God at work, getting to the finishing line won't be easy. It's still a hard race. Those words that we read earlier talked about making every effort. There's effort. And we think about running and we think about working and we think about striving. And when we get to the finishing line, we may be very worn out. We may be aching and hurting and bruised. And we may have taken a 27-mile detour to get there. Getting to the finishing line may not be easy. But in God's power, we will get there. That's the good news. Getting to the finishing line may not be easy, but in God's power and mercy, we will get there. Those who belong to Christ will get there. Called, beloved, kept. I lift up my eyes to the hills, says the psalm writer in Psalm 121. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. That's what the Lord is doing as we run this race. 
the Lord is our keeper. From this time forth and forevermore. And as we run, we can keep looking to him, the God who is able to keep us. From this time forth and forevermore. And that word forevermore leads us to the, the second question that we can ask this evening. Not just what, what is God doing now during the race, but what is it that he's prepared for us at the finishing line? When we get to the end, what is it that he has prepared for us, that he has in store for us? As some of you know, because I mentioned it this morning, I've got two young children, Abby turning five tomorrow and Reuben turning eight soon. And they're at that age where at the moment we get lots of invites to children's birthday parties. And in Bridge End, children's birthday parties only ever take place in one of two places. They either happen at Soft Landings, which is a soft play centre, or at Wiggly's Fun Farm, which is a, a farm but with, with extra fun bits. Uh, it's the only two places that primary school aged kids' parties happen. And they're both great places, but there are only so many Saturdays you want to spend there as adults, surrounded by lots of uh, screaming children. Uh, so, so please pray for us. Uh, but as we think uh, about the celebration that God has in store for his people, it's a celebration that really is worth getting excited about. It's not yet another invite to Wiggly's Fun Farm. This is something really exciting, something to get excited about. And we could imagine the invitation coming through with the details on it that Jude gives us. Where is this celebration going to take place? Jude tells us in verse 24, in the presence of God, in the presence of his glory, before his full majesty and splendor and greatness. That's where... And what's going to happen at this celebration? Well, he says that there's going to be great joy, which is something of an understatement, as we'll see, but there will be great joy. And who's going to be there? Who is it that's invited to this great celebration? Well, we're told it will be blameless people. And this evening... It should amaze us that that will include people like me and people like you. It should amaze us this evening that we could be counted among the blameless people. That Jesus would put this invite into our hands. Us, blameless, faultless before the presence of his glory. I think back to the end of last year when... My wife did jury duty. I don't know if any of you have done jury duty. Uh, but when you go there, you, if you get called to a trial, you have to work out with these other people about whether someone is to blame for a crime that they've been accused of. Now imagine you appeared before a jury. And this jury had access to a lot of evidence. In fact, they had a complete record of everything you've ever done. everything you've ever said, a transcript of everything you've ever thought, I wonder what they would make of that evidence. The Bible says we don't need to imagine because there is a perfect judge, God, who does know everything that I've ever done and everything I've ever said and everything I've ever thought. And all of my, my motivations and attitudes and priorities. He knows all of the blemishes on my moral record. He knows all of the sins that I'm guilty of. He knows all the ways that I've fallen short of his glory. In my thoughts and my attitudes and my priorities. In my failure to love him and my failure to love other people. He knows all of that for all of us. So when we appear before the presence of his glory, how can we claim to be blameless? The Bible says we deserve to be condemned. And condemned to what Jude describes as the gloom of utter darkness. One of the heaviest, most difficult phrases in the whole of the letter. It's what we deserve 
for our sin, to be condemned to the gloom of utter darkness. For our long record of crimes against God, the gloom of utter darkness. But Jude says, and God says to us through Jude, that he is able to present us blameless, faultless, spotless. How? Well, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let me just take you to one passage that shows us how sinners like us who deserve darkness can instead be presented blameless in God's sight. We'll just flip back a few pages in the Bible uh, to 1 Peter. And when we get to 1 Peter, if you look at chapter 1 and from verse 18, and talking about what God has done in his son, in Jesus. And these are wonderful words where Peter says uh, that we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. I'll read that again. You're ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Those words, without blemish or spot, they're words you find used in the Old Testament. And the, the sacrifices that were brought, you read through Leviticus, you see these kind of words come up. That the animals that were brought had to be without blemish. And it was, as these animals were offered, it was like they were an innocent sacrifice being offered in the place of guilty people. And Peter is saying that's what we see in Jesus offering himself as a sacrifice to God for our sin, that Jesus, as God's son, come in the flesh, that he's blameless, faultless, perfect, innocent. He never did anything wrong in his life on this earth. He never said or thought anything wrong. He always walked in perfect obedience to his Father in heaven, showed perfect love to everyone around him all the time, then there at the cross we see the innocent son dying in the place of guilty people like us. Sacrificed for us. So we could be welcomed into God's presence safely forever. When we come and trust in Jesus can find that he has taken the blame for us he's taken the blame for our sin in our place so we can have our sin washed away all of it and we can be covered with his perfection his righteousness his blamelessness so then when we get to the finishing line what will we see there we see people who deserve the gloom of utter darkness, instead standing before him blameless, enjoying his presence forever. No wonder Jude says there'll be great joy there. (laughs) This is a reason for great joy, that people who deserve the gloom of utter darkness will instead stand blameless before his presence with this great joy, and nothing, nothing will be able to disrupt that joy. Because as we're brought into the presence of God and his glory on that day at the finishing line, we see an end to all sin, end to the sin in our hearts, an end to all the suffering and pain of this world, an end to all the sorrows and sadness of this world, an end even to death. All of it will come to an end, all of that darkness and we know eternal joy in the presence of God's glory, that joy that we don't deserve, but that comes to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what God has prepared for his people at the end of the race of this life, at the finishing line. That's what God invites us to 
through his words. And if you're here this evening or you're joining online and you haven't RSVP'd to this invitation, it's not too late. It's not too late to come to Jesus, to come as we all need to come, admitting that you have sinned, that you've disobeyed the God who made you, that you're in need of forgiveness. And to come to Jesus asking that he would give you forgiveness. He would forgive your sin, wash that sin away, give you new life with God. And he would work in you to keep you going through this life and to keep you to that eternal celebration. You can come to Jesus today to find mercy and hope and to come to get to know this God who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, an understatement, wonderful eternal joy. We come back to that question I asked at the beginning, how, how will we keep going? How will we get to the end? I was thinking on the car, th thinking in the car on the way here. I was thinking about one of the first funerals I did when I became pastor of Lichard Mission. It was a funeral for a church member called Yvonne. And Yvonne had been connected with Lichard Mission since the church was founded in 1938. She used to play in the foundations of the building while it was being built when she was a little girl. She had this connection over all those years and all those decades. But when I knew her, it was the final years of her life. She'd obviously been very busy in the, the church in her younger years. But when I knew, knew her, she wasn't able to do any of that anymore. And she struggled with her eyesight. She had to have special devices to read the Bible. She struggled with her hearing. She struggled with her mobility. She lived alone and she had seen so many changes in society that were quite discouraging in lots of ways and she was very aware of her own failings as well. And when I went to visit her, it was always very obvious what it was that kept her going, even though it would be very easy to be discouraged there alone in a house. It was very obvious what it was that kept her going because every conversation she'd talk about her hope of heaven. She talked about her hope of glory, eternal glory in Jesus. And I don't mean just every conversation with me. The optician would get an annual reminder of the hope of heaven. Everyone. That's what she wanted to talk about. She looked forward to that day as she knew that God would keep her and by his mercy and power lead her into that eternal glory. And now he has kept her and she is in glory. I think about people like Yvonne as I think about keeping going. Yvonne who kept looking to God and trusted that this God was able to keep her and to keep her to that final celebration. So for us with all of the, the pressures around us and all of the dangers that lie ahead of us and all the sin and weakness in our lives that we're so aware of, how will we get to the end? Well, let's keep looking to God the God who is able to keep us and who will keep his people. And keep looking to the finishing line that lies ahead of us. He is able to present us blameless before the presence of his glory and that day will be a day of great joy that will never end. And in the meantime, the race will still be hard. We still need to run. We still need to keep ourselves and to build ourselves up and to make every effort. But as we run, we remember that his power is at work. So we can keep running with confidence and with hope. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. And we can all say... Amen. Amen.